Thank you, Vice Chancellor Moore. For the next blind date, I have two words for you. Denzel Washington. <laughs> it is my great pleasure this morning to introduce our keynote speaker. I've had the privilege of hearing him speak before, and I've joked to several colleagues that if he were just to stand at the microphone and laugh, you would still walk away feeling enlightened and inspired. Dr. Freeman A. Rybalski III has served as president of UMBC, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, since May 1992. His research and publications focus on science and math education, with an emphasis on minority participation in performance. He serves as a consultant to the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and universities and school systems across the country. He also sits on several corporate and civic boards. Examples include the Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Constellation Energy Group, the Franz Merrick Foundation, the Marguerite Casey Foundation as a chair, McCormick and Company Incorporated, and the Urban Institute. Examples of recent awards and honors include the following. Election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, receiving the prestigious McGraw Prize in Education, the U.S. Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring, and the Columbia University Teachers College Medal for Distinguished Service. He also was named an honorary, he also holds a number of honorary degrees, including most recently from Haverford College, Princeton University, Duke University, the University of Illinois, the University of Alabama Birmingham, Gallaudet University, Goucher College, the Medical University of South Carolina, Binghamton University, and Osos Community College. Just kidding, not the last one. He has co-authored two books, Beating the Odds and Overcoming the Odds, focusing on parenting and high-achieving African-American male and female students in science. Both books are used by universities, school systems, and community groups around the country. A child leader in the civil rights movement, Dr. Rabowski was prominently featured in Spike Lee's 1997 documentary, Four Little Girls, on the racially motivated bombing in 1963 of Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church. Born in 1950 in Birmingham, Alabama, Dr. Rabowski graduated at the age of 19 from Hampton Institute with highest honors in mathematics. At the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, he received his master's degree in mathematics and four years later, his doctorate in higher education administration at the age of 24. His complete and very impressive bio is included in your conference program. My dear colleagues, please join me in welcoming President Freeman Rabowski. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Denzel Washington, and I came here to see Lisa today. <laughs> I am delighted to be in your city, in New York. And I start by saying that I am a friend of so many of the people here, but since President Keyes is I'm on her campus, let me just say that it is a delight to be on the York College campus. How many of you consider yourselves le leaders? How many of you consider yourselves influential leaders on your campuses? How many of you are very pleased with the salaries you're making right now? <laughs> but how many of you truly believe it's going to be a better day one day, right? I hope that's good. That's good. I start by sharing several experiences. The first and most important is that I'm, I'm dedicating this talk to one of my students who died on Sunday. And I was with his family and with hundreds and hundreds of my own students last night 
at a memorial service on our campus. And I, I thought I would share the experience with you because it really was a collaboration involving students and student leaders, student affairs people, and academic affairs people. And the experience itself was, I thought, very heartwarming. His name was Jamie. Jamie Hurd. He was a junior, age 20, had serious diabetes problems, and was so smart and, and focused on biochemistry that he did not take care of himself. And he died in his sleep. Um, just, a, just such a tragedy. And all week long, faculty and staff and students have been working to try to make sense of this experience and to learn from this experience while celebrating Jamie's life. I want to read from my book, and I'll come back to Jamie at the end. I want to read from my book, Overcoming the Odds. My colleagues and I wrote two books focusing on very high achieving kids of color in science. And the second book on young women, Overcoming the Odds, begins with a paragraph from a, a freshman composition of a student. And I put this quote of hers at the beginning of the book because I was so shocked at what she said. Your uncle is hooked on crack, says my mother, as we park in front of his house. As I walk towards his house, I look to my right and see a couple of drug addicts looking, sitting on what used to be my aunt's favorite couch and enjoying the comforts of her once humble abode. On the steps, there sits a high school dropout, no older than the age of 17, counting the money he had earned from selling drugs. At the corner, the mother of a local drug kingpin took on his responsibility after he was killed in cold blood. My parents always stressed the importance of a good education and taught me to strive to be the best. But I have witnessed the effects of alcohol and drugs firsthand. And those experiences taught me that drugs are not the way to deal with life's bleak realities. I use society as my motivation to excel in all that I do because as a teenage black female, I am not often expected to do well. There's a sense of satisfaction in knowing I have achieved more than was expected. But even more important, I have achieved more than I expected. My hard work paid off. This young woman, I was just surprised first because I'm in a, in a fairly comfortable neighborhood. It's a community outside of the city of Baltimore, right at the BWI airport, almost 600 acres. And you don't think as often about that kind of issue. And yet, there was my student there in a special program for talented minority students on a predominantly white campus, writing about her own experiences. And I wanted to understand more so I got to know her for several reasons. Number one, we never know what somebody brings with them when they come into the classroom. We have no idea the hell they may have gone through even that morning. And even though they may be strong enough to get there and it look like everything's okay, we really don't know. Now what is significant is you, as leaders and professionals in student affairs, will often get into the head and heart of that young person even more quickly than a professor. Because you're not sitting in a class necessarily. You may be able to talk one-on-one -on -one and you get to know them. How many of, and, and so what happened, just to finish that story, she explained to me that when she was in about the ninth grade, the teacher in the classroom was talking to her and smelled the alcohol and looked at her eyes and could tell she had been doing something involving alcohol and drugs and called the parents and the mother came and the mother broke down and said she's gotten those habits from me because the mother knew she had a drug and alcohol problem and she then realized that it wasn't that just, just that she had that problem that it had spilled over to her daughter. And that wake-up call resulted in both getting into intervention and changing their lives. Well, I should tell you that that young woman has now graduated from my campus with a 3.9 in biochemical engineering and mathematics. Thank you. 
and she is now writing her dissertation focusing on breast cancer in a PhD program at the Johns Hopkins University. Give her a hand, would you? But the point I want you to think about is if somebody hadn't intervened, that young woman might be dead today. And the fact is that for so many of our students, the challenge we face is to understand first their strengths, because too often we talk about their deficiencies, am I right? To understand the strengths they bring when they just get to the campus, quite frankly, their dreams and their values as we work to help them consider the possibilities. I often say each of us has a story. Now, you all are in New York, and this is what we in the South call the North. You know that, right? <laughs> Well, I should tell you, to put things in perspective, people in Baltimore really don't even know they're in the South. We think of ourselves as being in between. <laughs> the fact is that people from my part of the country, I grew up in Birmingham. Now, that's the real South, right? the, the deep South, like Atlanta, Birmingham, and we would call Baltimore the upper South. Why do I tell you that? Well, Southerners like stories. Everybody likes stories. We Southerners really tell stories. How many of you saw the movie Steel Magnolias? Remember that movie? You all know, you remember that? Good movie. But at some point, somebody's in the beauty parlor bragging, and everybody knows the person's lying, and they're looking at each other, right? And the person leaves, and Dolly says, there's a story there. Remember that? Well, we all have stories. And I've told the story, my own story, I'm, thousand times. When I was a young man, I would have been embarrassed to talk about my personal situation. But the older I get, the more I realize there's nothing in our lives more important than our families. The older we get, the more we achieve, the more we realize parents, children, families, and friends. My, my mother often told the story about growing up in rural Alabama, really rural, below Montgomery. And and she talked about the, the fact that at age 12, she had to work as a maid. And working as that maid allowed her to see how wealthy people lived. And the most important point of the story was that they read. They were reading. And the lady would let my mother read a book when she finished her work. And reading gave her a chance to forget she was poor and to dream about the possibilities of what her life might be. And she noticed a growing difference between herself and her girlfriends. She said that the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she enjoyed the experience. And so she read more and more and more. Her girlfriends, in contrast, never read enough to become comfortable with reading or good at it, and therefore found it a painful experience and rarely did it. And she would watch her girlfriends reading assign, assign, assignments, and they would be moving their lips. You see people when they can't read well, and you see them frowning. And it was at that point she knew exactly what she wanted to do for the rest of her life, become a teacher. And she became a teacher of English. Now, the fact is, each of you, how many of you love to read, right? I mean, Americans will say that. If we could know that every young person learned to read well and loved to read, half of our job would be done. Am I right? Whether we're in whatever the field is, you know that as you work with young people, they've got challenges on the outside already. Of course they do. They're trying to balance outside work and life with school work. And much of that work, and I'm speaking as a mathematician, but much of that work involves reading and thinking and writing. Am I correct? And the math is another, another day I'll talk about that. Everybody on my campus knows I get goosebumps doing math problems, OK? <laughs> so my son says, Dad, you're not just a nerd. You are a mega nerd. <laughs> and I say, yeah, but mega nerds can pay their bills all the time. <laughs> if you got adult kids, you know what I'm talking about, all right? You know exactly what I'm talking about. But one of my mother's heroes, and I know uh, President Keyes will appreciate this, was Zora Neale Hurston. You know that name? <laughs> Spent time here in New York. A book, uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God, Ships at a Distance Have Every Man's Wish on Board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight 
never landing until the watcher turns his head away in resignation. His dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men and women. She was talking about two groups of people in our society, people like you. You've all had some dreams fulfilled. And then she was talking about people who, in the words of Langston Hughes, seem to always have dreams deferred. It occurs to me that the fundamental reason you're here today, the primary task that you have in your roles, is to help people to dream about the possibilities and then to help them develop the skills and the values they need to reach the dreams, the goals of their lives. And so my premise in all of what I say is that our dreams and our values determine not only who we are today, but who we will be as students, as scholars, as professionals, as a society tomorrow. I had the privilege for years as a graduate student of working in student affairs. And I've always felt that my work as an assistant dean of students at the University of Illinois, when I served as a director of Upward Bound, and when I worked as a director of a residential life of a residence hall, helped me appreciate a great deal about what student affairs people do to contribute substantially to the life of a community. Let me ask you several questions. How many of you are the first in your families or first generation to go to college? It's a great story. Look around the room. Keep your hands up. It's a great story. And I want you, one of my messages today is tell your story. I'll tell you why. Tell your story because, you see, when you went, people in the neighborhood, some people were proud of you. Some people might have said, here's a dollar for you, right? Or people in your church or synagogue or whatever, somebody is always going to be giving you support. Other people are saying, you know, she needs to go and get a husband. He needs to get a job. The naysayers, right? You know, you always had that group. They smile on your face and then go and talk about you. But there were some who were encouraging. But here's the point. You took the encouragement and the motivation from some people and the negativity from others and let it all motivate you to do what you needed to do. And you, you finished college and you got a job and you could get an apartment, you could have a way to get around and, and, all, and you had a paycheck. And you didn't have to live with your parents necessarily. You know, a lot of, of adult parents today, are, they ask me when they're about kids coming to college, they say, just tell me this, if my son comes to your college, can you promise me that five years from now, he will not be living at home? <laughs> so here's a recommendation to all, what you want to be able to say, if you want to recruit students, tell the families. I promise you, we will get them a job and they can move out of your basement. I promise. <laughs> It's a, it's a human story, isn't it? But I want you to tell, I want you to think about how you got here today. Because the more you can be inspired by your own story and by stories of colleagues, the more you can inspire your students to understand, listen, I have been where you are today, and I know what's possible. It's amazing to me hearing the stories can inspire us all. And it may be similarities, but there are always differences in each person's story. What I remember about my experience at Illinois was that I'd come from a wonderful undergrad experience. I had gone to Hampton, my beloved Hampton, a place I'm mean, my beloved. We Hamptons, we Hamptonians love our college, all right? Because we were nurtured and developed. And I got to my alma mater also, the University of Illinois, and there was not that warmth. Just to be perfect, I was the only black in the math class, I mean, and it was just very different. I'll never forget, I got an A minus on a test, and the professor wrote on my paper, you did surprisingly well. <laughs> now remember, my mother was an English teacher, so I go up to him and I say, why the adverb? <laughs> and you know what he did? He didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> And this, I tell this story to my students, not to make them bitter. I say, but here's the point. I could have either decided this man doesn't expect me to do well, and therefore I should drop out or just not work as hard, or I could decide, listen, that's his problem. 
I don't have time to be a victim. That was what I had to decide. That's what we must tell our students. You don't have time to be a victim. Don't let anyone else define who you are, either on campus or in the world. Am I right? It's very important. And here's my message to you, that, that somehow, as we think about the roles we play in student affairs, I am convinced that we must first see ourselves as leaders. I want, I, I tell people on my campus all the time, we all should be about the affairs of the business of student development. Am I right? I don't care where you are on the campus. And it is critical that we find ways of identifying the strengths of our campus in the area of student affairs, number one. Number two, of being great marketers. One of the things about student affairs people is they care about students, they work with students, they know they make a difference, but I'm not convinced in a lot of places they thought about how to market what they do to other students, but also to faculty and the administration. And that's one of my challenges to you, that you need to be documenting the difference that you make. When you see the difference in helping a student stay there, and I'll tell you, presidents, if you talk about any president, presidents want to know that we can recruit students and keep students and graduate students. Bottom line, because you know what? In addition to the reputation, it's about the money. Am I right? If you're bringing in students and they're leaving, you're not keeping a lot of money. It takes a lot more to keep bringing them in the door and then seeing them leave. Am I right? You are a fundamental strength of any institution in helping students to decide to stay. I tell the story all the time, and anytime I'm going up the elevator and I see a student, I want to know who that student is. I want to know the names. We've got about 12,000 students, but about 9,000 undergrads. I know about 2,000 personally. I know their names. I look at their records. In a lot of cases, I know their girlfriends and boyfriends' names. I'm a southerner. I'm nosy. You get the point? I'm nosy. I want to know. The people want to know. I tell my young women of all races, and we've got, them, we've got students from 140 different countries, so we're like New York, okay, from all over. I tell my young women of all, I say, if you act like a doormat, he will treat you like a doormat. Is that true? Now give me a hand for that. That's the truth, that we must teach young people to respect themselves. I tell the young men, what goes around comes around. If you mistreat somebody, somebody's going to treat you mistreat, if not your sister, your daughter one day, all right? So watch how you treat people. And, and I'm, I'm saying to you that one of the things we do when we really care about students, as they say, is to keep it real. I can be academic on the one hand and talk about Dostoevsky, but on the next hand, I need to be able to keep it real. We can talk about biotechnology on my campus, and we can talk about the, the Beckett play from the night before, but I want students to feel they can talk to me. And I want my colleagues, not just my student affairs colleagues, but my faculty colleagues, to appreciate the fact that we must not only be concerned about the intellectual development of students, but the emotional development of students. Am I right about that? The emotional development. Relationships, sense of self. Very important. I will tell you that there are several strategies I want to suggest to you. How many of you read the book, A Whole New Mind, by Daniel Pink? You know that book? I want you to write that down. Daniel Pink has a book out in recent years, last year or two, uh, A Whole New Mind. And he talks about left brain and right brain thinking. And I want to read a quote from the book. The subtitle is From the Information Age to the Conceptual Age. He says, the era of left brain dominance and the information age it engendered is giving way to a new world in which artistic and holistic right brain abilities mark the fault line between who gets ahead and who falls behind. Our brains, as we know, are divided into two hemispheres. The left is sequential, logical, and analytical. The right is nonlinear, intuitive and holistic. Today, the defining skills of the previous era, the left brain capabilities that powered the information age, are necessary but no longer sufficient. And the capabilities we once disdained are thought frivolous. The right brain qualities, inventiveness, empathy, joyfulness, meaning, increasingly will determine who flourishes and who flounders. For individuals, for families, for organizations, professional success 
and personal fulfillment now require a whole new mind. And now this is what I want you to think about. I am convinced that institutions that are enlightened want to help staff and faculty and students develop holistically. That we should be thinking about not only the analytical skills, but those skills we tend to associate with creativity, with looking at the whole picture, with determining meaning in life as being just as critical. Too often, I know that in my own area, when we look at things we're doing in math and science, we can be very linear in approach. But the people who really make the fabulous discoveries on my campus and throughout the world tend to bring creativity to the analysis and to think out of the box. And that's what I want to challenge you to do this morning. I want you to think about what you do now and ask the question, how else might we do our work in such a way that the campus fully appreciates what we bring to the table? And that may mean several things. Everything from ways in which you have teams of faculty and staff working together on student problems, to having focus to groups of students where faculty and staff have a chance together to hear what people have to say. How many of you get chances to listen to groups of students talk about their perceptions of the college environment regularly? Very good. How many of you have faculty in the room when you're having those conversations? And there's the issue I want you to think about. I remember in my days in Illinois, we'd be working with problems, a lot of special students of color who were just flunking out constantly. The question I got over and over again, do you think I'm dumb? Do you think I'm dumb? Because kids were coming out of the Chicago schools, and we were down in Urbana-Champaign, and most of the white kids were from wonderful suburban schools that had a better education, so the black and Hispanic kids were just having a terrible time, especially in math and science. And I was constantly trying to deal with this sense of self to get them, and I had come from an HBCU, and we had been taught, as I went to grad school, we had to be prepared. People are gonna look at you like you're not supposed to be there. They had told us that. They had said, but believe in yourself. Don't let anybody define you. You can't be a victim. And then find strength by finding other people with whom you can study and work. And it made all the difference in the world. It just, and I saw that, and it, that was 35 years ago, and I said, you know, this is what we have to do. We have to build community. And so I would go around trying to find a faculty member who'd want to understand those issues. I'm going to say this to you. You should be saying to your presidents and to your provosts and your deans, we need to be working with faculty if we want to keep students on this campus. Am I right? We need to be working with faculty we want to keep. Because I can tell you this, not one campus in this room, including my own, can say we keep all the students we'd like to keep until graduation. Am I right? The fact is students come in and they go. And I'm saying if we ought to think about how best to keep them there and to give them support as they work to build their academic skills, as they deal with the, the, the challenges of life on the outside, we have to have a chance to develop a whole new mindset about how to solve problems and help them solve problems. It's very important. And a part of it has to do with your being creative in pulling faculty into those discussions. This week we had. And I pull in, I had some staff members and some faculty members, people from residential life to people from student, student, uh, student activities and some others to listen with faculty from a variety of disciplines to a group of seniors who are about to graduate. And I do these focus groups with seniors. I do them with every group, but I especially like the kind we do during this period because I asked this question. I said, I want you to tell me the good, the bad, and the ugly. I said, the only rule we have is start with the good. Because if you start with the ugly, it's down here from then on. You get I always remember that rule. If you're going to have people assess things, get them to tell you something that's positive first. Because it sets a tone. It says, OK, these things work well. If you start off by people complaining, it just builds on itself. It's all complaint. You get my point? Get a positive context which pro provides a kind of health for the env environment, and then you can listen to the other. And amazingly, I watched as faculty and staff looked at each other when people said all kinds of comments. They said, well, in this department, some of the faculty were really good, but we could never find these two, okay? 
or in this department, uh, amazingly, some were really good teachers, and two of them, you'd get, a, you'd get a better grade if you just didn't go to class, because they were so unclear, all right? You know, it was amazing, and this, we've got a great campus, with students doing well and all that, but the point is, we can always be better. Am I right? Success is never final. But here's the point that I will make. At one point, one student said, I've got some great professors, but the people I've really gotten to know, and, and he mentioned three people, and they were all from student affairs. And he said, I just wish I could know one of my professors the way I know these people. Very interesting comment. And what we had and afterwards, and we, we have a lot of faculty who really spend time with students, but afterwards, one of the faculty members, professors said, you know, I'd like every professor to hear students talking about what they really think about what they really think. Because here's the point. There's some students who are going to be assertive and they get to know a lot of you and faculty, am I right? But there are other people who don't reach out, don't know how to be aggressive. The challenge is that the average student isn't going to be going up to everybody trying to get from that person what they can. The question is, how can you in student affairs help the typical student who may not be self-assertive to get to know both faculty and staff in order to profit from what the environment has to offer. There's one other book I want to recommend to you. You know the book Execution? Not as killing anybody, by the way. Execution as in follow through. And it's by Bossidy, B-O-S-S-I-D-Y. One of the challenges in American life in universities and colleges and community colleges is we all tend to know things that need to be done and in higher education, what do we do when we have a problem? We set up a committee, am I right? <laughs> am I right? And the next year, the president says, where are we? We're working on it. <laughs> am I right? You know, we are so good at setting up committees, we are far less effective in getting to the bottom line of getting it done. Am I right about that? It's just the truth, it really is. Very important point. We always talk about it ought to be, and years later, we're still talking about the same problem. All of us are guilty of that. I know we are. All of, when I go around the country, I see it. If you look at this book, Execution, it talks about creating a culture in which you look at the people who need to do certain things, the strategy you're going to use, and the actual operation, and then how you assess whether or not you're making progress, how you assess it. And I'm suggesting to you, you look at that book. It's a great book for helping to create a culture that focuses on not accountability in a bureaucratic sense, but in did we make a difference? If you say your goal is to have this campus appreciating much more of what student affairs people do, then by the time you're finished with whatever you decide to do, you want to have some way of evaluating whether or not administrators, students, and faculty can say, this is more of what they do. This is how they have made a difference in these areas. These are lessons we can learn. I want you to see yourselves as leaders in terms of your expertise in thinking about the whole student. I want you to see yourselves as people who can talk about the co-curricular activities being a very important part of what a student needs to get a good job to be able to interview well, to be able to speak well, to have opportunities to lead. Because when we talk about leadership training and all the enlightened colleges are talking about ways of, of, of preparing students to be leaders, then clearly the role that student affairs people play will be one that focuses on students having opportunities to be leaders, to reflect on leadership, to set goals, to motivate people, to speak and write and think in a clear and convincing manner. These are skills that you have already. Everybody knows that the student affairs side will be the side that will give more of an ear to students. I'm saying the part of your role is to make sure everybody from the president to the provost to faculty remember that they too are student affairs people. Very important lesson. You know, I will tell you in closing that this week, I have encouraged faculty, professors, and staff who knew Jamie to reflect on the significance of his life with our students and to have a variety of sessions that focus on everything from the challenges of diabetes to ways in which Jamie made us all laugh 
to creative ways, out of the box ways, we could celebrate his life. How, I said, I want you to be out of the box. We're gonna all cry, of course, but we wanna do more than that. And let me just tell you how they work together to help students begin to appreciate the significance of his life. Uh, Jamie was very involved in Facebook, the students are, and he had written a statement about the significance of life. And we've taken that and made it a part of a kind of, of, a, of a, a challenge to ourselves on my campus. Jamie loved fruit. He was always giving somebody an apple or an orange. And so at the memorial site, uh, um, uh, service last night, they had all this fruit for about 700 students just to celebrate nature and fruit and Jamie. And then out of the box, they had all this technology with his statement there and with people who could talk about different aspects of his life, from being on the rugby team to being in the biochemistry department to being a graduate of an inner city high school to the, the fun he had with people in the residential life area to his being a, a woolly, we call them. These are kids who help with orientation, all right? And everybody was told, bring a story. This is my campus, UMBC, at its very best. Every race, every culture, every religion, men and women all sang, we come because we love our brother. As warm and fuzzy as it sounds, it represented the very essence of life, and it's all of what we do every day to make a difference. And so I challenge you to watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are, not only when people can see you, but what will you do when nobody's watching? There's your character. So watch your thoughts, they become your words, your words, your actions, your actions, your habits, your habits, your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny, dreams, and values. You are special, student affairs leaders, and you can be even better. Thank you all very much. Dr. Robowski. Yes. Uh, you placed a great deal of emphasis on uh, faculty and students' uh, engagement and the key role of student affairs in facilitating of that as president at your campus. Yes. What sort of concrete encouragement or rewards do you offer for those to engage in collaborations? It's a great question. If you heard him, he's saying, how do we work to in to encourage collaboration between faculty and staff. There are many ways. First of all, we really do believe that, that faculty interaction with students should be a part of overall evaluation and encouragement and incentive plans. It is a research campus, and so we are constantly in, involving undergraduates in the research. By the way, we lead the country among predominantly whites in sending blacks, for example, on to science PhDs. Give me a big hand for that. And so getting students into labs, having discussions about the academic work on the one hand, and then for our campus, which is heavily residential, having faculty work in residence halls regularly in living learning floors. We have floors involving Chinese culture and Russian culture. We have floors involving community service. And we have faculty members who serve as advisors on those floors and who actually come over and, because I do it, I go over and sit down and have pizza and sit on the floor at 11 at night just talking, you know. And, and, so, and so faculty would be with me, but faculty do their own and they'll invite me. We have music floors, arts floors, and so faculty are in the residence halls, but, but faculty also serve as advisors to all the clubs. We've got 150 clubs on campus. And we use, we want them to document their interaction as a part of their assessment of what they're doing during the year, quite frankly. And we do celebrate 
involvement of faculty with students in a variety of activities. Now, what's really great is that there are a number of staff members in student affairs who, have, who are also scholars in their own rights and, and writing articles and, and giving presentations who work with faculty in um, projects, problem solving. And I want to give you one example. The, and this is all in the spirit of out of the box. I have encouraged the campus to be kooky. I want, I want to get, I said, we are boring as higher education. We are boring too often. Well, in the class, out of the class. We've been doing the same thing the same way for so many years. And so I'm saying, surprise me. Surprise me with something interesting, intellectually interesting. And so students working with some faculty advisors, working with student affairs people, working with administrative affairs people, came up with a campaign called Improve It. And what they wanted to do was to encourage the entire campus to develop teams. We believe in collaboration. You're talking here about collaborative leadership and achievement and success. To, to get teams of student affairs, people with other staff on campus, with faculty members, with students, to identify critical problems on our campus and to propose in research proposals solutions. And so they had everything from recruitment issues, to retention issues, to green space issues, uh, to uh, the problem that a lot of our students are really, we are really a, a campus of nerds. We're very proud to be nerds, all right? Very proud. We are this year second in the country in chess. Give me a big hand for that. Second in the country in chess. And my campus did go to the NCAA Division I basketball dance. Give me a big hand for that. Big hand. All right, I have to remember what the words are. <laughs> and most important, all of my seniors on the basketball team are graduating and they can read well. Give me a big hand for that. That's what I'm talking about. And they're getting jobs. Give me a big hand for that. I'm very proud of that. Now here is the, we beat, and we beat Binghamton in lacrosse last night. Give me a hand for that. <laughs> no, I know, it's New York. But the, uh, here's, <laughs> I understand. Great campus, Binghamton, wait a minute. Here's, here's the fact that we had a group of judges who consisted of student affairs, administrative affairs, the marketing people, faculty, and student leaders. And the process, a six-month process of identifying problems, of having teams of people working together, of the students agreeing to put between fifty dollars and $100,000 of their money you know, students have hundreds of thousands of dollars in, from student phase activities that they could use to bring a band in, all right? That they put their money there as a, a, um, um, a pot of money to be used to fund the proposals. And the university matched their money. You get my point? And then we had this major competition, marketing, I mean, the, the I mean, substantive review. It did several things. It gave more student leaders a chance to know faculty leaders and know staff. It identified critical problems. We kept it real. We really did talk about substantive issues. And finally, we came up with some fascinating ideas. Now, the project that won is in green space. We're going to be developing this green space that's going to be a teaching tool, which is great. And we're giving $50,000 to that. But what's, what's even more significant is all the other problems identified have now had major recommendations that we can use for next year with ourselves, with students, and with faculty. So it's a great example of getting students and faculty and staff working on problem solving, focusing on the campus. We call it Improve It. If you look on our web, you'll see some of that information. That's one example. Final question. Someone. Ask me. And that's going to have to be it. Okay, you do this with me. It's thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, destiny. One more time. Thoughts, words, actions, habits, Character, destiny. Here we go. Watch your thoughts, they become your. Watch your words, they become your. Watch your actions, they become your. And watch your habits, they become your. Watch your character, it becomes your. Thank you all, New York. Thank you. Jones back to the stage for a special presentation to President Radowski. We, we have a little something for you. 
President Grabowski in appreciation of the time you spent with us this morning from the City University of New York, the 2008 CUNY Regional Student Affairs Conference presented to President Freeman Grabowski in grateful appreciation for your dedicated service to the student affairs community, May 2nd, 2008. Thank you so much. Mabowski, another hand. That was great. I just want to do a few little housekeeping things. I'm going to make this very fast. For those of you who haven't been to our campus before, straight across from here, you were in the academic building when you registered. Most of the conference sessions are there. There is one session at 11.30 that's in the health and phys ed building, which is the same place we'll have lunch. That is to your left but across the street when you leave this building. But it's the Health and Phys Ed building. It's one session, it's called Go to the Head of the Class. That's at 11.30. But that's the same building where we'll be having lunch. And then we'll come back over to the academic building once again. And then the, the evening is going to be a reception and a raffle. And we have some fabulous, fabulous prizes. I think you'll really enjoy it. So we hope that you, again, that you'll be able to spend the whole day. We have ambassadors around. They'll help you, those of you who are going over to the Phys Ed building, if you need direction. But it's directly across. It's very easy to get to. Just be careful crossing the street. So thank you. And head over for your morning sessions. <laughs> 